little history. I'm born of open data here in New York City. Basically, we had our startup basically kickstarted when Mayor Bloomberg 10 years ago started Big Apps. So I managed to convince my boss to make an entry into Big Apps 2. We won the large organization award, but then the following year, my boss told me what did we get from that beyond that photo op. So I decided to take a gamble and with one of my longtime friends, we work out of his basement for six months and we entered into Big Apps 3. Fortunately, that, that the gamble paid off and we really got engaged with open data and started our startup on Zodia. Like five years later, we got acquired by a Silicon Valley gov tech firm. So that was a good thing, a, a nice exit for us. And while we were doing that, we managed to install about 50 or so data portals across the U.S. These are some cities we, we work with and some agencies we work with. But there was this consistent problem that we always came across, and that was data quality, right? So they had all these data sets they wanted to publish, and even with their private sector clients. The data pipelines were very brittle. As things change, and they should change. They shouldn't be static, right? As the business conditions change, as you capture more data, metadata, you need to change that pipeline. But it was very hard to maintain, and that was like the number one issue, support issue we had when we were running all those data portals when we were and this is not a secret that's just people who deal with data on a daily basis the dirty secret of data scientists is a lot of it is janitor work like you basically clean the data normalize data enrich the data and before you can actually build models and do anything with it and the thing with that is there's it requires specialized tools and skill sets like tools that you need to buy uh, they're expensive. You know, have you tried loading like a million rows into Excel? You can't, right? It just blows up, right? Or you need to learn specialized skills. You need to learn Jupyter Notebook or Pandas, and only certain people can do that. Like so, and most of the time they're slow too. Like a lot of things with Python and scriptable languages, they're not really performant. It's not, in my mind, the ideal thing is like, like duct tape for data. You need something that you can quickly deploy, put duct tape in, normalize the data quickly, and then do your preliminary analysis. And then once you say you do your analysis, okay, this is something that is stable enough, we can make it into the data pipeline. You can reuse that thing that you built, that duct tape you use for a production pipeline. So that was the data wrangling challenge that we encountered across all these installations that we wanted to solve. But after we got acquired by OpenGov in 2016, you know, it didn't, you know, even though we, we managed to install across all these installations, we decided to move on and get back the, the, the band together again and apply all the lessons we learned across these installations. And we built, we started this company that here, we were thinking of really launching it in earnest in 2020, what happened in 2020. Oh, I've dated much worse guys than him. Much worse. And at least he's famous. Yeah, that's how 2020 <laughs> was. Uh, a match made in hell. So, but I didn't go two ways. We got some gigs with some private sector clients. And there was one uh, fintech client that we were working for. We were building a data portal for them. Because they had all these models. They have all these data that they buy. They, data that they wrangle and build and curate. And they didn't have a central store to describe all this data and all, all the risks with the data, the downstream users, all that good stuff. So they didn't have that. So one of the, the challenges we had was also a lot of the models they had were proprietary. So we couldn't really like enter the metadata manually, right? Typically, if you maintain a catalog, you look at the data, you enter the metadata, and then because you're familiar with the data, what they wanted to do was build a crawler that they just, it will ingest the data and will, it will do some initial classification of the data and populate the catalog automatically with some starter metadata. So you don't have a blank slate when you look at the catalog. If you have some starter metadata that describes the category, that describes what are the, free, the descriptive statistics about, about that data set. And their data came in all formats. So we wanted to work with a universal data format, or CSV, CSV, everybody. Any system can produce and handle that and export that. 
you wanted it to be cross-platform, so you, you can build, do some initial assessment on your laptop, but then you can deploy it in a production pipeline somewhere. It has to be super fast, blazing fast. It has to be open source and easy to learn. So even like a uh, Excel expert who's not familiar with the command line, even though you'll be exposed to the command line, but you can easily pick it up. It's very intuitive. It has a lot of help. So this is what we came up with. It's a, uh, this logo, it is it's like an intentionally kitschy logo. I mess up together. <laughs> USB wrangling data, it's the CSV data wrangler. That's some things I cut and pasted using Google. And let's do a demo. So QSV, this, just make this bigger. Basically it's a command line program for indexing, slicing, analyzing, splitting, enriching, validating, and joining CSV files. So you don't need to have a database. You don't need to have a ETL program. You don't need to have a specialized skills. You just need basically access to the command line and QSV. And you can do things without having to make sure you have a database, you ramp it up, and all that good stuff. Guiding principle that we, when we, we built that, actually I, I can take credit for it. The beauty of open source is I actually stood on the shoulders of somebody else who initially built the foundation for QSV. There's this project called XSV that was really, when I was in that FinTech firm, the, I was using it and I said, oh, this is amazing. It's really fast, but I need this change. I need this change. The beauty of open source is you can always scratch your itch and contribute those changes, right? Uh, with the hope that it's not exactly altruistic, there's that enlightened self-interest you have when you participate in an open source system, that when your changes are merged into the project, that it gets meant. So that was my motivation. And I had all these changes that I did for when I was scratching my itch for that project. And then I saw some other changes that the community was making to X XSV that were not being merged. Fortunately, the maintainer of the original project uh, said, okay, it's, if you want to do a fork and you know, so long as you do attribution and link back to us, that's okay. So since then, this was last, early last year, we forked uh, XSV, created QSV, and we basically doubled the number of commands and a lot of the things that the community were looking for and contributed, I just basically marshaled that together. So just to give you a flavor of what this data wrangling toolkit does doing all these ETL transformation to some basic natural language parsing functions to do similarity, sentiment analysis, to detect profanity, to de detect, you know, if, if this, this thing sound like this, to detect the language, if there's like any free text in the, in the CSV that you want to do when you build a model, it does things like the duplicate data. And, and this is not a trivial problem. We were helping with an IOT pilot in San Antonio, and they were emitting all these feeds from the different IoT sensors, Internet of Things sensors, and we were finding a lot of data quality errors. A lot of them were duplicates, so we we, we built that and on. And all these things basically allow you to, basically from the command line, do things that before what we were doing, we had to build, like basically write a, write a custom program to do it, or build, or, or buy an expensive, license program to, to do something similar. Okay. So let me give a demo. So the, this, if you want to follow along on the demo a bit, basically what I'll do is I'll do the whirlwind tour and then we apply it. And this is like a generic demo. And then we'll apply it to like the 311 data set and see what we can do with it. So here, just to see it in action, there's nothing like diving in. Let's download, I, I downloaded this already, it's this file with all the world cities with, with in population more than a million. So as with most recipes, uh, typically you have the cookbook and the, the cookbook is here, the cheat sheet. So I'll put the cheat sheet here. So you may want to look at that page with the whirlwind tour. And basically the first thing we do is we download this file called uh, World Cities Population not CSV, which I re-downloaded. And if I want to find out the, the headers for that CSV file, there's nothing like just typing headers. And it tells me, okay, you have seven columns in here. These are the names of the columns. And if I want to get stats about 
that file, let's see how many rows are in there. So there are a million rows in that data set. So a million rows and the data set is about 46 megabytes in size. So let's compile some statistics about the contents of that. This is all cities, right? Not the ones that are anymore. Yeah, all cities. So there in this the second and a half, we have the stats. So these are stats that, so you can see here, you know, it did a sum, it, it discovered the data type. In two seconds, it did compiled all these statistics of the data. In two seconds, a 50 megabyte file with 1 million rows, okay, on a laptop. And that's just the beginning. These are just the high level statistics. What if I really wanted to dig into really some more meaty statistics? So it's not as fast, but still like maybe four seconds. If that, maybe more like three seconds. So now we have things like quartile, lower fence, Q1. And if you're familiar with statistics, these are not trivial things to calculate. Like standard deviation, all these things, null count, how many values are null, what's the variance, what's the cardinality of this thing. That's fast. And the, the secret ingredient there is we, QSV is written in a language called Rust. I don't know if anybody heard about Rust. So it's like C and C+, which is like, if, you know, I think only assembler is more down to the metal than, than C and C+. C is really close to the metal. Rust is almost like C+. It has all these abstractions, but it really is very performant. That's why we have that kind of performance. So now we have that statistic. So we can even do things like, I'm going out of the script now. Let's see. Let, maybe let's try to find out what are the most uh, frequent values in each column? Two, two seconds after that. So here is basically, there are seven columns, right? We have seven columns in there and it basically compiled the 10 most frequent values for these columns. So if we look at, so we can see the, this value, so, there are 109 instances of San Antonio, 108 of San Jose, 96 of Santa Rosa. All in two seconds, it compiled the most frequently occurring values, top 10 occurring values, and the cardinality of each value. So with this tool, you can start imagining, I don't know if you played with pandas or any other data tool. Compiling something like this will take you an afternoon, right? You will, you'll use NumPy and Pandas and, but with this, you can quickly do like quick tasks and it's so quick that you can, and because it's from the, in the command line, you can then just incorporate it into the data pipeline that you do. Okay. Let me go back to the script. So what else are we trying to discover going to the script again? So we were, we're looking at the world city's population. Uh, we found out it had seven columns. We tried to compile characteristics by running descriptive stats on it. We just skipped this part. We found out it had so many rows. Now let's start doing some interesting things with the data beyond just doing basic statistics. I did the frequency you showed me, I showed you how we were doing that. Okay. Say I want to do something with the population. So here, another thing I wanted to point out is one of the guiding principles we built when we did. QSV is, it has to be composable. So if you work on the command line, you're familiar with, you know, this whole concept of piping and standard input and standard output. So basically the input of one command can become the, in, and the, its output can become the input of another command. That's why it's composable. So here, basically you can see the first thing we do is we do a search for anything that has a uh, value, right? So here, here's the regular expression. Because some of these, like here, you will see there are 98, 900, no, there are 980,000 cities with population set to null. So I'm only interested in getting cities with the population. So here I'm saying, okay, 
search for everything where the population column is not null because it has digits inside it using this regular expression. This is the, the, the file we're working on. Goes into this next operation, also powered by QSV, saying, okay, now we get the, the country, the, the city, accent city, how it's pronounced, and the population, and do a sampling of that from the million with a seed of 42, so it's reproducible. You, you, that's why we seeded it. I wanted a sample of 10. And then here I saying, okay, here's a, a kind of a geeky command line thing. There's this command called T. What it allows you to do is, it allows you to have a T intersection where basically save this into a file called sample.csv. At the same time, display it on the screen with this QSV table command. So we have here one, two, three, four, five commands handling a 50 megabyte file with a million rows. Let's see how long it takes. That's super fast, right? That's fast. And I cannot take credit for it. The guy who built it, uh, his name Andrew Gallant, is based in, in Massachusetts. He is one of the key people in the Rust ecosystem. So a lot of the things that was done, I just basically stood on his shoulders. But that was the kind of things that he was able to do. Okay, so let's see now. So that's interesting, but say now this listing of countries and, and their population, we don't have the continent information. How do I join it with the continent information? Typically, if you're familiar with how this is done in the traditional sense, you would need a database and you would do a join in the database, right? So first of all, you need to feed the database, then you do a join, and that takes time. But what if I have, which I downloaded already, I have this file and the country for, for the country code. Yeah. So let's look at it. I only want to say, look at the first 100, uh, 10. So for each country, you get the, the continent code, the continent name, two letter code. I want to basically enrich my data set with this country and continent information. So how do I do that if I don't have a database to join? So here's the recipe for how to do it. Let me quickly describe what the recipe does. So it does a join. Are people familiar with the concept of joining in databases? Right. So here it says join, case insensitive join, left join. Basically, look at the country table, the country column in this file called sample.csv, and look at the two letter country code column in this other file, country continents code.csv. Join them. Okay. Once you join them, select these columns to display. If you play with joints, once you join two tables, it becomes really wide, right? You're only interested in that. And then oftentimes you will have duplicate rows. So you want to do the duplicate the rows. And then you want to rename the columns to something friendlier, not without these underscores and shorter, and then display it on the screen with USB tape. Okay. So. That's one, two, three, four, five commands joining two files. One is big. Let's see how that's how fast <laughs> it is. Yeah, and this is just a sample. This is not all of it because we're just sampling. Because we're just doing samples, we're trying out the approach. Let's do it for all of it. Okay, I'm doing all of it now. Now it takes a little bit more time, but it's still seconds. We're not talking about minutes. And the thing it produced is this file, about 992,000 rows. So these are all the cities with the enriched information with the country and the continent and whose population is not known. So just to give us a taste of it, let's do a slice, say the first 10, and then let's display it on the screen for the first. Okay. I think I spoke there the population oh okay the population is not being filtered it's just enrich it basically we didn't do the filtering like we did okay so this is a big file and there are cities you know you want now you want to get to group them into separate csv files for each country so we have a command for that as well so here this file with the 992,000 rows 
for all cities. Actually, we didn't filter on the population. We want to partition it. There's a separate CSV file by country. We look at the country column and then we save it in a new directory by country. All these files for all 100 plus countries. Each CSV file basically has all the cities. And that's just two, three seconds for a small file. So, yep, this is nice and good, but you, know, you, did, you did go here to talk about using it with New York City's open data. So, what's one of the largest data sets in New York City? The 311. And then there's another large one, the, the taxi data is also very large. But it's not as, it's just basically drop, picking up and dropping off. Uh, and maybe they don't have as many rows now with, with Uber and all that stuff. So, let's do this. Okay, let's fix this. I don't need to teach. Uh, this is a 15 gigabyte file. Basically, two hours downloaded yesterday from New York City's open data system. It has, let's look how many rows it has. So, this was all the 3 on 1 calls from 2010 to yesterday. It has 27 million, 27.8 million rows, right? 15 gigabytes, 27.8 million rows. Let's see how it performs if you want to do statistical description of what's in there. A okay. oh, 311 stats. Now, this will take a little bit, not as much, but we're still talking seconds. I should have timed it. I think it's in order of like 10, 15 seconds. 15 gigabytes, 27.8 million rows. It's done. So, actually, let me see. I have a log file. Let's see how long it took that we can look at. So, that thing actually oh, took 23 seconds. It took 23 seconds. And what are the stats in there? This time, let's use, let's use Excel. Okay, let me uh, just reformat it. It's one thing with Windows, it doesn't like uh, UTF-8, so I have a little utility to fix it. Now we're using Windows, so sometimes it acts funky. With so in 24 seconds, scan 27 million rows, 15 gigabytes, and it compiled this statistics on it. And these are just the high level statistics. If we want to do things beyond this, let's run a more meaty one. There's, oh, one thing I, I never showed you is the help for, for QSV. So it has a lot of commands, right? There are 40 commands. And notice it checks regularly to see if there are any updates or there are no updates because it's just compiled. But if you, there's a command that you want more information on, as most command line programs, you can just ask for help. And then it does things, it will tell you what other statistics it can compute, like mode. If you're familiar, it's like it's the, the most commonly occurring value cardinality, what are the unique values, median, null count, how many rows are null, quartiles. This is for examining the distribution of the data. And then dates, it can even fix it in for dates. So for that data set, and I'm sure this will take a tad longer. The first one was just simple statistics, and they were built to work on streaming data. So it's streaming, so as it loads the each record, it computes it with a running count, those statistics. That's why basically the, the time of that run is basically how long it is for it to read the whole file as it compiles the running statistics. The everything statistics, that's why there's an everything mode, is it basically loads everything into memory. And then it has to do some calculations in memory because some things you cannot really do on streaming data. So, yeah, so this will be like two, three, four times longer. One other reason why this is fast, if you're, if you, oh, actually that kind of bit me. One reason this is fast, unlike if you use like NumPy, Pandas, and some other scripting tools, is it's multi-threading. So basically I have a laptop with 16 CP, logical CPU. So it basically chunks the whole file into 16 chunks and then does the statistics for that. The problem with that is it now locked my until it finishes. So let's wait for it. 
it will come back. So anyway, while we wait, yes, you have a question. Can you use a default place to, when you create the files, for May 301 all stat CSV, where does it say? Basically, it saves it in the current directory. Okay, as long as you're in that directory. Yeah, yeah but if you're familiar with command line piping commands, like here, you see the greater than sign. I see oh, like terminal. Yeah, terminal yeah. command. So you said I can direct it to say go to another directory by just qualifying. It's really consuming all the CPU. What features are you getting from people that you'd like to add next? I guess what kind of changes would you think that needs it? Yeah. So right now we're helping. There's a, a state agency we're working with in the Midwest, and basically they're gathering data about all the water resources in that state where the rainfall, you know, water collection and all that. And one of the, so they have humongous data, you can imagine. And the, we're building a data portal for them. And one of the things they want is as you upload the data, something in the background to scan the data and give some classification of what's inside. Right now we do statistics, right? With statistics, we can just describe the attributes of the different columns. But they want to do something like, oh, you, you mentioned this phrase, or well, let's say there's a phrase for flood or floodplain. They want to automatically tag that data set based on, on the data without them having to tag it manually. So that's something I'm interested in taking. It's not done yet. Some of the attempts we made to do natural language uh, processing is basically moving towards that, but you know, it's, it's not easy. Okay, I think I lock up myself here. Let's see. Let's see if I can. Yeah, that's something we need to fix. <laughs> that's the thing with open source. I didn't actually try this out before I did it. I thought it would not take this. Hold on. I just need to be able. Okay, while we wait, one thing I want to show you is one thing of note. Since we have all the 311 complaints going back to 2010, of late with all the vaccine mandates, and the proof of vaccination things happening. Oh, it finished. Great. <laughs> I was trying to buy time. B11 all stats. Oops, I need to fix the encoding. See, you can even Excel. Hold on. Let me just show you what's inside. There was a problem there. I ran out of memory. It didn't. <laughs> That's why. But it 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 did it, it compile it. Yeah, at zero kilobytes. But this one I actually tried. I should have tested that earlier. So one thing I'm curious about is say. If we can search this data set of just the word vaccine, make it case insensitive vaccine. So this one I know will work. <laughs> so this one still takes, so basically what it's doing, it's scanning the whole file. Right now I'm just using a regular text there, vaccine, but it's regular expressions. So you can put regular expressions in there that can really do fancy searches that, okay, it starts with this and ends with this. But I, just for the purposes of demo, I'll, I'll just do this. And this takes about 30 seconds or so. So I want to do some little q and a too. You got three minutes to do it. Oh, wait, but <laughs> I'll give you an extra couple minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I should have cut down the file first before I did the search, but it, it, it should come. But anyway, demo <laughs> hassles. It's still, it's work in progress, but it can handle this very large files. We, we have this in, in, in production pipelines. Of course, we're not just, but see it. Took about 30, 40 seconds. And so here, how many rows do we have? So there are 7,400 rows talking about vaccine in, in the system. So let's open that file. So in here, you can see a, a lot of these are, were created recently because of the vaccine mandates, verification, and all that. People were calling in for incident. If you look at the description, oftentimes you would have somebody is supporting somebody not complying with a vaccine mandate. And so this is an easy way to do an investigation of large data sets, right? Okay, how many are vaccines? Like during the workshop over at the, the main hall, they were talking about, they were doing investigations, looking at the data. And this tool is meant to facilitate that, to do those initial investigations. So then, oh, okay, it took me 30 seconds to ask that question out of a big file. No, I could have done a better job because I know maybe I don't need all 27 million rows. I'm only interested in the last one year. That would have cut down my response time. I think. But yep, it, that's the, the tool we built and we're happy to 
you know, to get feedback. If you have any things you want to add, you want to see, you know, just go to the website. Feel free to use it. It's open source, license free. It's our gift because we always, when we help with data pipelines, when we help deploy data portals, it's a recurring issue and it's always a source of pain. How do we do this data wrangling? And also it's a challenge too in the public sector, right? Especially in the public sector, they don't necessarily have the, the ability to attract data scientists and retain some because they can easily go to a Wall Street firm or a FinTech firm or to one of the big tech firms to do all the, the fancy data science stuff. So this is like a, an easy tool to, to use. With that, no, it's really, right now it, it supports CSV files, PSV files, and actually MDJSON files. But the, the intent is once you do your initial investigation, if you want to bring it into Parquet, to Spark or do any other, data breaks that you want to do, like with all these heavy duty data science tools, then you can do it there. This is really meant for, I say it's not really exactly wait, like quick, like the duct tape of data investigation. First of all, this is awesome. Thank you for making this. I had two quick questions. Is there a way where you could have changed the data type? Like you, it showed you the type of each data. Let's say I had a string that I've forced that to be integer if I wanted to. And when you did the join, I think you did a left join. Could you do any type of join? Yeah. When it does a join, it treats everything as text. Oh, okay. yeah. Treats everything as text. It doesn't get a type sensitive. Oh, those were two separate questions. Okay. I just meant like when you did the join, could I have done an inner join on those two? Yeah. And the data type, like if I had some, like if I had something that I know it's supposed to be a integer, but there are like a few junk lines and it's forcing it to be string. Could I have changed that here? That's one good thing. It's, that's one investigation you can do. When you run the stats command, it scans the whole file and it will tell you based on the scan, if something is an integer, right? Or a string, you say you have all integer and then you have say non applicable somewhere or none somewhere. And then that basically converted that whole column to string. So then what you can do is with another QSV command, why is this string? I'm expecting this to be integer. You can say, show me for that column, what are the non-integer types with, the, with, with that regular expression? And then it will just show you those rows. And then I could just export. Them. And then remove them and say, okay, I want this thing sliced out, remove this from my set, and then I can keep transforming. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone.